Cast your minds back to Sunday. My apologies. The clink was booming Sheck Wes's Mo Bamba pre-drive. The fans were getting hyped. This was an atmosphere ripe for a run-denying performance. And then the defence got gashed. The swagger vanished in very un Pete Carroll fashion. Now the defence wasn't the main problem. After a shaky first half full of explosive plays, they gave up zero second half points despite a rotten offence making their task tough. Adjustments were made and executed. Still though, Carroll's ethos is to stop the run first, and Seattle failed to do this to epic proportions. Throughout the game, Melvin Gordon carried 16 times to 113 yards. That's a 7.1 yard per carry average that includes two clock chewing runs the defence could key on. Giving up such a total, 160 rushing yards at 7.3 a run, Seattle was gashed on the ground. This was most unusual given the strength of this roster. Defensive tackle depth. A low key issue with Carroll is his game day inactive decision. Most vivid is his Super Bowl 49 decision to leave slot cornerback Marcus Burley inactive despite a banged up secondary. The result, apologies for reminding you, was an injured Thorold Simon dueling with Julian Edelman inside. Against the Chargers, Carroll strangely chose to suit up only two defensive tackles. Nazir Jones's weird absences continued. Puna Ford, perfect for this type of game was also left out. Hindsight is a powerful king, but both inactive decisions were bemusing before the matchups. A logical step would have been for Seattle to run a lot of their bare slash 46 slash double eagle front, placing two three techs like Brandon Jackson and Quinton Jefferson either side of a nose tackle. Yet we saw little of this. The issues the defense had with three technique leverage are concerning. Most troublesome, was how this affected their play against tosses. Given that the Los Angeles Rams run a lot of wide zone that will enjoy similar success against three technique positioning problems. Seattle also experienced difficulties against jet motion, another favorite of the Rams. These issues must be addressed. Here I highlight the bemusing play of the run defense. Okay, so first Chargers play of the game, first offensive play that is. And Seattle scored in their first offensive drive, which, you know, we can stop complaining about that two weeks in a row. Let's not get carried away. There's plenty to complain about, but not that, which is nice. Anyhow, to the run game and defending it. Ball on the six, good starting field position for the Seattle defence to defend. And they mess it up. So Allen's going to come in here and he's motioning in to sort of a sniffer wing back type alignment. Now, how Seattle plays this is interesting. So you've got Melvin Gordon in the backfield. He's clearly the guy you game plan all week for. The primary run threat. And their formation is heavy. You know, this is a 13 personnel. You've got two tight ends here, one here. They're thinking run, which is smart. But the problem is, they end up playing the run, which it actually isn't. So right here, he's clearly orchestrating. Oh, look at this wing back. So what you need to know about Seattle's linebackers is they have different roles on this play. Mingo's actually playing pretty similarly to Shaquille Griffin, the cornerback. Both of them are pure edge setters, but they have coverage responsibility. Griffin a bit different because he's a corner. They run to their side, they have to set that edge. These three linebackers, well, two linebackers and Bradley McDougald, who's excelled in the box as a strong safety. They're slightly different. So, McDougald and Wagner are turnback players. That means if a run comes to their side of the field, they have to get outside of the running back. So, any tackle they're making on the running back would be with their, in for instance, Wagner's case, that would be with his left shoulder. Running back's coming here, he gets outside of him, left shoulder. However, KJ Wright, the middle guy, he's the chase through linebacker. He runs through the ball carrier. He makes a tackle. He scrapes. So, while if it was on McDougald's side, he'd tackle with his right shoulder, KJ Wright would make the tackle with his left shoulder. So Seattle's clearly thinking it's going to be an inside split zone. They're worried about this B gap or C gap. They're concerned. And that's smart. I mean, their alignment on its own, you know, they've got one, two, three, four, five players out here, which isn't really enough given one, two, three, four, five, six, potentially. However, it's handed off to Allen. And they're still in a good position to play it, despite the fact they're majorly concerned about this two tight end, one wing back sort of thing. 
So here's Allen. He's going to get the ball. Turn back player McDougal. He's in position. He can see what's going on here. Clark as well. Pretty good position. And Griffin, he's going to get run off. But, you know, he can be that extra edge guy if the runner was going to bounce after Clark met him. Unfortunately, Clark doesn't do his job. Comes inside. I'm not really sure why. I think he's reading this lineman who's done well actually to get to McDougal, the turn back player. But he's coming inside and Alan's coming outside. And Clark realises, oh, I've sort of lost the leverage advantage I had from my wide lineman on Alan. And I'm the contained player. This isn't great. Slips. That's bad. McDougal, the turn back player. Remember, he's meant to be trying to get outside of that runner. He's not doing that. He's sealed. Griffin, run off slightly. He's outside in trying to turn it inside. Clark's on the floor. So what ends up happening is you have a lovely little alley. Or horrid little alley if you're Seattle. And it's basically up to Thompson to make this play. And slow down for you all. Here's Clark. Just watch. He's coming in. He's cheating. I think he thinks... I'm, I'm not really sure. It's like he thinks Alan's going to try cut it here. But it's, wide, it's a wide play. But he's still in pretty good position. He just needs to start getting outside rapidly. And he doesn't do that. He slips instead. And it's over. So, later on the same drive, another jet issue. Ball on 31, first and 10. Less heavy personnel from Los Angeles, but still fairly heavy because you've got a, you know, only two wide receivers. But this guy here is actually Austin Eckler, the running back. And he comes in on a little right to left, left to right, pre snap motion. Giving a little look for, you know, in the opening game script for the offensive coordinator to plan on. Bit of information. This you may again blame Clark for. It's another jet problem. But I don't. Now my reasoning for that is it's quite clear to me that the technique Frank Clark plays with here is purely coached. He's reading this tackle. And Seattle often does this with their ends. They want them to play through the linemen. So controlling the gap, but pushing the lineman right through the gap, surging them into the backfield, causing chaos for the running back. So if we watch Clark, he reads the down block, so he comes up, and if this was a you know an inside run, that running back isn't going to try cut it with Frank Clark standing there. He's going to just go right into the strength of the defence. However, on jet sweeps, it gives Clark a bit of an issue because you know he's completely removed his leverage of the situation. He's at the front side of the play. They've got a blocker here in this wing back. It's trouble. This is this is real trouble. But Seattle's in a pretty good position to play it. However, they mess it up. This is Justin Coleman. They were in nickel. And Justin Coleman here, he is basically the force player. He has to come down. And often Seattle, when setting the edge in their force player, they're taught to take out the lead blocker. So that's what he does. He goes for this wing back. But he needs to have the awareness that he has a linebacker right behind him, the turn back player, who's also getting outside. It's tricky for Coleman because right here you see he's thinking, take this guy out, he'll cut up field, right into the linebacker help. However, Though difficult, as the play develops, you can clearly see that Coleman should have had a degree of patience, stayed outside, but not taken on the block. Because the runner, seeing the linebacker here, actually tries to bounce it further. And this is where Coleman makes his mistake. He needs to get far more outside on this block, if taking it on at all. Instead, he's too head up. He needs to be about here, not here because the runner sees this and takes it and really if Coleman had come here the linebacker could have taken the block so as Coleman takes this on the runner sees it you end up getting two players bump into each other 
and he gets the edge in the run, whereas really that should have been minimal gain. There was quite a few very puzzling calls or movements from Seattle's interior of their defensive line, which, considering, as we've mentioned, the amount of defensive tackles they decided to carry, is pretty, pretty disappointing to see. So here they motion in the fullback from like a tight end sort of wing back look into a fullback role. Seattle has to get realigned, do a fine job of that. And I just want you really primarily to focus on Quinton Jefferson here. He's in quite a tight three tech sort of role. You'd think that'd be to play the B gap. So if we just talk through responsibilities here, Wagner, probably reading off this nose, Shamar Stephen, probably picking an A gap. Right, he's the guy you want chasing through. McDougald, edge setter, pure edge setter, kind of turn back guy, and again Mingo, turn back guy. But let's focus on the front side because they're running a toss. Toss the ball, and I don't know what this is. I just do not know what that is. So, it's so weird. I mean, let's reverse it. Okay, so we're back where we were. And it's like they've got a call. I mean, I was watching John Glenn's clinic on a lot of things, really. At least the Seahawks linebacker coach now. But it's done back in 2015. And they have all sorts of slants and stuff against certain looks. And one of them is called Pirate, where the three tech will slant in. But this isn't even a slant. This is just going inside. And he's just taking himself out of the play. Maybe the idea is for Wagner to flow across. But McDougald here has to do a better job as well. He needs to take, come down and take the full back. He does sort of take someone. But really, I'm not sure what Seattle's doing here. I mean, this is just a mess. They have three on three. And look how many people on the back side of the tops. And if we run that back one more time, the actions of this three tech not being in the B gap, which you'd expect them to be, and coming in, are so odd. Because it's not like Wagner's exchanging for him and Wagner's going to scrape all the way around, which is tough anyway. Wagner actually stays for the back door. He's staying for the cutback. And on the play side, the charge is just like, thank you very much. All blocked up, terrible tackling, Gordon's gone, touchdown given up, and really, really bad stuff from Seattle. So, the Chargers now leading, and the theme of weird 3-tech play continues. Tight 3-tech play. This time, Jaron Reed, who had a really bad game, but I'm not sure how much of that can be attributed to him, and whether it was actually just, you know, very strange coaching calls. So... Chargers shift their strength for the passing side. Wright is actually removed out of the box by that. Uh, two tight ends, balanced front, and Seattle responds by putting Mingo down again as like, you know, edge sort of guy on the tight end. And they've got this tight three, you could almost call this a double eagle look, two three techs perspective making this guy look a bit wider than he is I think but your issue is going to be here again focus on Jaron Reed and how he plays this on the play side of the run stepped inside offensive lineman is very happy with that because his job is to seal this B gap there is no B gap player Run the ball more. Reed's been worked because his leverage is just wrong from his first step. Wagner is left having to flow massively. Wagner tries to get to the B gap. Reed is completely out of the play. Gordon cuts back. Huge run. Just watch his first step. I really do not understand. Boom. Moves inside, trying to play through the lineman, trying to play him head up. But the problem is, 
that lineman's just using that technique against him. He's sealed inside. And okay, he tries to squeeze the run. Once he's once he's been out leverage, he tries to squeeze the run. But because of the man of the run, this play's just awful. It's just a natural cutback length. Reed's completely out of the play. Gordon just seeing this. Wagner's tried to get to the open B. Look at this hole. I mean, look at that. It's like hash mark to hash mark. It's ridiculous. When you think of Seattle's linebackers, you think of fast flow, quick stuff. Here they're in nickel. Hill coming down late into the box as a an extra fit. And here, really, he has the B. Wagner the A. Stevens gets worked out of his A. He really, really you want him either going this side if Wagner's getting this A gap. And in the backfield, they're running some sort of trap to get Reed, which they do. Stephen finally gets this A gap. Other A gap comes open. But look how hesitant Wright is staying back here. I understand he's a turn back guy. But come get the ball carrier. He makes a tackle in the end, but it's, it's very odd. This time it's the turn of Rasheem Green to do something weird. And the Chargers all day used the aggression of this Type 3 technique against Seattle. So, this puller, Green, you know, he, he takes advantage and he squeezes through this gap. However, pulling guard coming to knock him out, and he gets so upfield, where, I mean, where's the B gap? There's, there's no B gap again. And Gordon's off to the races. Just the degree of patience needed. And it's, it is a bit like they call a pirate call. And they try slant in from this three tech, and they try slant in. But slanting in against this sort of thing, they just get butchered. Jordan taken out by the guy who leaves green. Green taken out by this guard coming across here. Green too far upfield, Jordan sealed, and it's just the B gap dominated. Not great. And then on back to back plays, Jalen Reed showed the issues that had plagued the three technique the whole game. They're the sort of issues that when they happen in the fourth quarter, you start to think, well, this can't be a coaching thing because. If they're, I mean, for instance, the pirate call, Seattle will coach that slant from the three tech and they'll call that slant from the defensive end when they want to stop a split backfield or, you know, like eye formation, strong close sort of run where they bend it back. But why do it against a team who's running outside you and counteracting that? That wouldn't make sense, would it? Surely you'd learn your lesson by the fourth quarter. So I don't think it can be that. I think this just is poor technique or something, some slant I don't know about, some stunt I don't know about. But for Seattle to keep running it, it that's nonsensical. That's, that's lunacy. So end zone copy. Here is Reed. He's in that type three. Just watch his first step. Stepping inside. Offensive lineman's very happy about that. He can use that against him. Chargers running it behind the fullback, fullback lead just up the B gap. And look how wide this B gap is. This lineman can, is free completely to come out because the tight ends block here. And again, one, two, three, one, two, three. Reed completely sealed. His first step took him completely out of the play. And Gordon can cut up the B gap for a good run. Watch. Jaron Reed again, inside, sealed inside, nowhere near, up the B. So the Chargers got the six yards, great way to start their drive when they're up by nine points looking to really seal this game. And they do that classic tight end motion in, into the backfield. And what happened last time when that happened? They ran a toss. It's the fourth quarter, Reed again, tight three, it's almost a two. That's how tight he was playing it. And I've no idea, again, why he'd 
he'd step inside and why Seattle even if they were worried about this bench run which is like this with the fullback going like this why Seattle would keep doing the thing which has failed I think this I mean if it was just one player doing it then I'd understand it a bit more I mean Reed made the most mistakes but it wasn't just him I mean I've shown you in earlier examples other three techs slash tight three techs making the mistake but here he, he does it again maybe it was a coaching point that Seattle overemphasized of playing through the alignment but the Chargers again enjoy it watch his footwork inside that's he's out of the play because it's a toss he's just done maybe Wright is meant to exchange with him so Reed takes A Wright takes B uh, but because it's such an outside play, I mean, he's never going to be up the B anyway. And even if it was, it'd get some yardage because of how bad Reed's positioning and leverage is now after his inside step. And defensive end is shifted inside, actually, with this fullback motion inside. He's sealed. So if they've got a 1-2-3 versus 1-2-3 on the perimeter of the toss. Toss goes upfield. Gordon gets a massive, massive game.